Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to foster, stimulate and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free programs, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or you can visit us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube. On behalf of our literary committee, it's my pleasure, pleasure to introduce Heather Cox Richardson. Heather has been called Facebook's historian. She's an eloquent academic whose current events newsletter, Letters from an American, is now followed by over half a million readers on Facebook and Twitter, including commentator Bill Moyers, who features her letters on his website. She's a professor of history at Boston College and the co-host with Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Ron Zuskind of the NPR podcast, Freak Out and Carry On. Heather follows her accomplished early books on Reconstruction and the Republican Party with How the South Won the Civil War, a provocative revisionist history. This timely account, which the Washington Post called masterful, traces the story of the American paradox and the competing claims of equality and subordination woven into the nation's fabric and identity. Heather will be in conversation with Joanne B. Freeman, class of 1954 professor of history and American studies at Yale University and leading scholar of early American politics, political culture, and political violence. She is the author of the award-winning Affairs of Honor, National Politics in the New Republic, editor of Alexander Hamilton Writings, and The Essential Hamilton. Her most recent book, The Field of Blood, Violence in Congress and the Road to Civil War is a New York Times notable book of 2018. Joanne has appeared in numerous uh, documentaries and has commented on history and politics past and present on PBS, NPR, CNN, and MSNBC, as well as the New York Times, Washington Post, and The Atlantic, amongst many others. Her online lecture course, The American Revolution, has been viewed by hundreds of thousands of people around the world. How the South Won the Civil War, as well as Joanne's books, uh, can be purchased from our independent bookseller, Books on Call, and we'll be sharing the link in the chat during the um, program. Um, books on Call will also reach out to everyone who purchases a book um, to see if they would like both Joanne and Heather to inscribe the books personally, just as an added treat. Uh, following the conversation will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. And without any further ado, let me turn it over to Heather and Joanne. Please enjoy the program. Well, hello to everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here this evening with Heather uh, to chat with you about matters political, historical, and otherwise. Um, Heather's book is about oligarchy and democracy. And Heather and I decided we'd like to focus on the democracy side of that equation this evening and talk a little bit about what preserves democracy, what holds it up, what protects it, what things are less than helpful for democracy and along the way to talk about faith in democracy and, and what that means and why that's important. And we thought that we would do that first by talking a little bit about historical examples that are going to shed light on democracy and on the present and then flip things around and talk a little bit about the present and how the past can tell us something about the present. So thank you for being here, Joanne. And it's such a pleasure to be here at this particular um, meeting and, um, and get a chance to talk with the, this uh, organization and also with you again about, um, about where we are in this particular moment. But first of all, I have to ask, I was shocked to hear that uh, Field of Blood came out in 2018. I know. <laughs> it did yeah. come out in 2018. It feels like yesterday and we live in a strange time continuum at present now. And it feels like it came out a million years ago. 
it does. It does. So when we were talking earlier about uh, about democracy and about restoring faith in democracy and what that might have looked like, because of course, you know, the, the whole um, how the South won the Civil War is about how a democracy gives rise to an oligarchy, how oligarchs manage to tear down democracy. But then that also raises the question of how do you restore faith in a democracy? And the one that always I always go back to, especially in this particular moment, is uh, the election of 1800 when people really thought that America was done, it was over, and that people really were uh, going to tear the country apart and everything would be, was over, that it had been a very nice little experiment, but now we were done. And I wondered if you would start us off talking about your knowledge of that, because it's such an interesting moment. Oh, for sure. And, you know, um, I bet that Heather would say the same thing. When you're a historian and you're living through interesting times, your, your mind naturally goes back in time to find moments that have the same feeling or the same logic. And as Heather just suggested, the election of 1800, the presidential election of 1800, it's a moment that has a lot of similarities to our current moment now. Um, so it's a moment when the country was extremely, extremely polarized. Uh, at that point, you had Federalists who were in power and Republicans, Jeffersonian Republicans who were trying to get power. The Federalists in power were doing everything that they could do to make change in government seem scary, bad, un-American. Um, they were basically broadcasting um, political slogans like vote for John Adams uh, and vote for religion, vote for Thomas Jefferson and vote for no God. <laughs> so they were blunt. <laughs> Yeah, very blunt. But but the election really did ultimately boil down to each side accusing the other of being un-American, of um, intending to destroy the American experiment. And the country was less than a decade old or just about a decade old at that point. So there was no assuming that it could survive. So the fears weren't sort of crazy early Americans, but there was a lot of logic in those fears. So the election, you build up to the election, and it's the first really, really heavily contested presidential election. Only once before had there been a real contest. And in this particular election, as it ends up, the two candidates running for president and vice president as Republicans, Jeffersonian Republicans, tie. So then it's unknown what's going to happen. And it seems as though obviously one or the other of them will become president, but Aaron Burr, the vice presidential candidate, may or may not be true to Republicanism. Maybe he would side with the Federalists. And there ends up being a lot of anxiety building up about how, what's going to happen with this election. How will it turn out? And you end up having people in two states, I believe um, Maryland and Pennsylvania, um, stockpiling guns in case they needed to go to Washington to seize the government if the election seemed as though it went some kind of illegitimate way. So it's, it's an actual constitutional crisis, major constitutional crisis, when people of various sorts are really beginning to lose faith in the system of democracy, it hasn't been around for that long, and are beginning to question what the other side plans to do. And there, when you look at the correspondence from this period, you see a lot of people writing to each other, essentially saying over and over again, you don't really think those guys are going to do this extreme thing, do you? Like, they're not going to really, like, they're not going to be guns, right? Or they're not going to just stop the election or they're not, and they're all of these sort of horrific episodes that each side is trying to point to the other one, but then saying, well, no, they're not gonna really do that, right? We have enough faith in them as fellow Americans. And lo and behold, eventually after 36 times, the, the tie gets thrown into the house and they can't break it and they can't break it and the nation is watching and people are going to Washington to see what happens. Will it tie, break or not? And then ultimately it does. But now you have the nation that just went through this major crisis and you have extremely polarized sides not trusting each other. So then a really interesting question is, well, then what happens to the democratic process? What happens at that moment? So, so the ties between Jefferson and um, Alan Burr, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And if you don't know that reference, you should absolutely look up the Got Milk. Drink milk, yes. <laughs> and, yeah, Got Milk. Um, but that, that does raise the question. I mean, one of the things that the 1800 election does, I think, is it restores faith uh, in the idea of a two-party system. 
And that's, you know, this wonderful moment where Jefferson comes out of the election. He's like, yeah, we were really mean to each other before the election, but now that I'm president, everybody should just follow me. We don't need two parties any longer. And, um, and obviously it's incredibly self-serving, you know how I feel about Jefferson, but it does raise the question of like, how does, how do people heal after this traumatic an experience the way that they did after 1800? Because you look at the way people are talking going into that and literally people are crossing the street so they don't have to talk to each other. And, and I love the idea that Jefferson is gonna kill God, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's, there's nothing new under the sun, right? And, and, you know, all the things that they accused each other of and the idea that Adams was going to be a monarchist and that the people weren't getting a say and that this really was the destruction of American democracy. And, you know, you and I lined up, we're going to talk about a, a m bunch of these moments, but this is really the one. I mean, people really could have gone and fought a civil war and that would have been it. American democracy wouldn't have even made the, the European history books. So how did they come together after that? Well, so it's interesting. Um, people, despite all of the polarization, despite the fact that it's as extreme as it was in all of the ways that I and Heather have been saying, um, once the election happens, first Jefferson does, when he finally wins the election, make an inaugural speech in which he does say, we're all Federalists, we're all Republicans, right? Let's all come back together as Americans. Behind also, me. Par pardon? <laughs> Behind me. Behind me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're all following me now, Thomas Jefferson. That's right, right exactly. absolutely. But he, he and most other people at that moment are willing to step back and allow the political process to kick into gear, right? There's an election. It was a contested election. People didn't know if it would work. It works. There's someone chosen as president and people actually take a breath. And you can see, you know, extreme Federalists are writing letters to each other saying things like, okay, let's wait and see, like, what's this guy going to do? Maybe it's going to be okay. Of course, the Federalists don't end up thinking it's okay, but they're willing to give him a break. And Jefferson himself, when he's asked, well, what would you have done if there had been warfare or violence or, or what would you have done? And he says, well, the system is arranged so that we could have had a constitutional convention, tweaked the constitution and just kept going along. So they really had faith, despite the fact that they thought the system could dissolve at any minute, they also had faith that given faith in that system, it could continue to percolate along and it would help preserve the new republic. So, so one of the things that, um, that is interesting, I think, about American history is the stuff that I picked up in the book from there, that um, how do you get from a system like that that looks like a democracy into what becomes by 1860 an oligarchy? Like, how do, uh, does a democracy turn into that? And what, of course, what I argued was that that trust and that faith in the system was fairly easily manipulated because at the base of that system was the idea that um, equality really depended on inequality. The, uh, the equality that was in the Declaration of Independence, um, and, and I do pick on Jefferson. Somebody asked why I, I'm, I have an animosity toward Jefferson. It is because he is hypocritical. And I, there, there are three characters in America I like to pick on because they're hypocritical. And that is, you know, Jefferson's one of them because he always goes up to Washington and goes, you know, parties are terrible. We don't need to have any parties. And, you know, some people are out there starting parties and he's the one doing it. And that always just pisses me off that he does that. But, but it's kind of a joke that I don't like him because of course he's brilliant in so many ways. But I, you know, Sam and P. Chase does the same thing. He's the secretary of the treasury in, during the civil war. But anyway, so the question is how do you get from this system where people trust it and trust the system to a, to a place where a very few people have control. And that was really the heart of the, um, the new book, uh, How the South Won the Civil War. And what I argued was because based in this, um, um, it, it baked into American equality was, was the inequality of uh, people of color and women not being considered equals, what that did was whenever there was an opportunity for people of color or later on women to get, um, uh, to become equal, to have a say in American society, oligarchs were able to mobilize racism especially, but later on ra uh, sexism and also classism to consolidate power. And gradually they would get, they would come into office, they would start to put in place policies that, um, 
that uh, discriminated against certainly people of color and women, but also gradually against poorer white people. And as poor, poor white voters said, you know, this is not what we want, they would then take over the system by making sure fewer people voted and eventually then by taking over the national system. And so that was the argument in the, the How the South Won the Civil War, the idea that by 1850, people in the um, in the, the democracy, the, the Southern democracy, the people in charge of that believed that they were really the ones who should run everything, that American democracy fundamentally did not mean that everybody was created equal, that American democracy fundamentally meant that a few wealthy men really should run things. And Lincoln stood against that. And Lincoln eventually said, um, you know, this is not what American democracy is. American democracy means that everybody should have equality of access to resources and equality of equality before the law. And then what the book does is it traces out how that um, how that that Confederate ideology that some people are better than others takes root in the West and then takes back over American society. But what um, and I and we're going to get to that, um, but. This question of legitimacy and the question that, you, that comes up in, in the 1850s after um, this period, this crisis period of 1800, the question that comes up in the 1850s is once again the question of legitimacy and a and democracy that's been torn apart. And one of the things that Joanne was talking about is how people restore their faith in democracy. And that's really the crux moment of the new book because what it argues is that um, we that Americans didn't really have faith in the system after the war and they didn't really have faith in institutions precisely because of two things one because Americans moved west after the war and ideology rerouted the ideology of the Confederates rerouted itself out of the west but also because and I think this is really important in this moment that particular president was not Thomas Jefferson saying, hey, let's all come together. And it was not Abraham Lincoln saying, let's all come together. It was Andrew Johnson because of that assassin's bullet in the back of Abraham Lincoln's head, who did not say we should have faith in America or we should have faith in the system. He said, we should tear the system apart. We are a country of white supremacists. We, are, we should not try and have everybody vote. We need to make sure only white people vote. And he doubled down on that contradiction inherent in the idea of equality that some people were inherently unequal. So it's a very different moment in a lot of ways than 1800 because of the leadership. I don't know, does that make sense, Joanne? It does, although um, I wouldn't even say that in 1800, um, the government in the nation was more small d democratic um, because they're debating at that time how democratic a country it should be um, and how involved should people be and, and how, how much popular participation is safe in a democracy. And so there are some pretty fundamental questions being debated even at that point. So um, I don't even know if I'd say there was sort of a happy democratic period that lost way. I would say there were experiments in sort of the democratic process. And then the Civil War in one way or another um, throws a new challenge at that, at the union, at the government in many ways. But isn't that sort of the question, like how do you, not you personally, but how does one, how does a, how does a democratic nation heal after it has a period when someone tries to take it over? In this case, in the, 18, in the 1800s, um, the argument, of course, is the Federalists are trying to create an um, oligarchy. And in the 1850s, the Southern Democrats were trying to create an oligarchy. And I think you could argue in the present, you've got this, this particular Republican Party trying to create an oligarchy. And so what I looked at in the book was how that rises. But the other question is, how do you heal from that? How does a country come back together? Which is a really good question, Heather. <laughs> How do, well, I, I think... Um, they told me I had to end the book on an upbeat note. Ah, okay. Well, that's good. That gives me a hint of what the answer is. Um, well, I think when you're talking about democracy and you're talking about um, faith in democracy, um, you're talking about different kinds of faith. So you're talking about faith in the system, faith in the political process, um, faith in political institutions. And then you're kind of talking about um, a bigger faith, right? A faith in the nation and in the people in it. A, a faith that is connected to 
institutions of government, but that is more about how Americans feel about each other ultimately and where they can and can't go and what they assume about each other. So this isn't, I guess this isn't necessarily an answer to your question, but it is saying there are different things that you lose faith in and probably different ways of building those things back up. Well, so I wonder though, when you talk about the earlier period, I wonder if it is because the uh, the voting body was white men and only white men and they could have faith in each other because the way it breaks down after the Civil War, of course, is that at first um, white supremacists in the South, the, the Southern Democrats turn against African American voters with the idea that they're black. And then when Grant puts that down with the development of the Department of Justice and then with uh, the putting down of the KKK, they say, oh, ne never mind. We didn't mean we didn't like them because they're black. What we really meant was that we don't like that the Republicans created national taxation during the war. And we don't like that poor voters are voting for things like schools and roads and, you know, um, hospitals and prosthetics. And in order to do those things, we have to use tax dollars and those tax dollars are going to be paid for by white people. And that set up this idea that if you let poor people vote and in the late 19th century, in right after the Civil War, that meant black people. Um, it's going to mean immigrants in the North by the 1870s, 1880s. But what that means is it's going to require a redistribution of wealth, essentially from white people to people of color. And that makes it very hard, I think, for people to face the idea of healing after a bitterly divided period. And maybe one of the reasons that the Civil War was so messy um, and the healing after the Civil War was so messy or maybe never happened. Um, but I mean, do you think it comes down to the fact that it's all white guys in the 1800s? Uh, well, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, that's a pretty fundamental longstanding assumption about who the we is in, in governance and in power and in the upper registers of democracy. Yeah, it's white men of property and then the property restrictions go down somewhat, but it's still pretty much white men. Um, when you see, you know, in the, the age of Jackson, the rise of real political parties as opposed to whatever's happening earlier in the Republic, it's still, they're political parties of white men and there's a um, great sort of rush of democratic fervor when you read diaries and letters of people who are involved at that moment when these parties, especially the Jacksonian Democrats are first coming around being born, you see these people swept up into this feeling that, wow, it's like this national club that has power and we believe in the same America. There's a real power to that, but it's a, it's a one very defined kind of population. So yeah, I think part of what happens is diversification or the threat of diversification. And, and yet within, you know, Jackson's running around doing his thing, let's say in 1830, I mean, it's a little bit earlier than that. And by 18, you know, 52, they're braining each other on the floor of Congress. Right. I mean, they're all, they're all, well, you know, some sort of men of property and they're all white guys and they're whacking each other over the head with sticks. Right, right. Well, but that's partly because the, in Congress, at least, in the 1830s and 1840s and part of the 1850s, things have been pretty balanced. There have been a system of sorts, as I talk about in my last book, The Field of Blood, a system of violence, right? So Southerners protected slavery by threatening violence over people who seemingly opposed them. And for a long time, Northerners and those who seemingly opposed them backed down, partly because they didn't want to be humiliated in front of the nation, partly for reasons of party. They didn't want to mess up their party's chances at having power. What changes in the second half of the 1850s, which is kind of in line of what we're talking about here, about fundamentals being thrown up in arms, so to speak, uh, is that you get a new party, and, and you write about this very much in your book, but you get the, the anti-slavery Republican Party comes about in the mid-1850s, and suddenly you have Northerners in Congress who are willing to fight and come to Washington with guns. So That's suddenly the balance of power is upset. And, and the people who had power are upset about the fact that suddenly they don't seem to have the same power that they had. The people who didn't have power are very much aggressively standing up and saying, we're not here to bow down anymore. And you have one of those moments where the people, along the lines of what you've been saying, the people who are used to having power, a kind of oligarchic power that they can take for granted, feel threatened in some way. So that's really interesting, though, is that um, 
you know, uh, the, I write about language and the way language consolidates power, but we're identifying the same thing. You're talking about violence, but it's actually almost a social thing. Um, when, when, the, when people stand up to the bullies and say, we're not, because that's a really dramatic moment when Northerners say, we're going to fight back. And, um, and I hadn't thought about it that way, that, that that's one of the things that really causes a major lack of equilibrium. And maybe one we're in right now where people who have been bullied for a long time stand up and say, no, no, we're not going to put up with this any longer. And somebody asked in the questions, which I am watching over here, somebody asked about Tilden. And I cannot tell you how much I would love to just talk about Tilden. Um, <laughs> because like nobody ever asks about Tilden. But, um, but that, that might be a moment that is different than that in that in, uh, th I'm sorry, that's the election of 1876 when there is a contest obviously where uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, who's a Republican, wins uh, in the electoral college, I'm, I'm sorry, Tilden wins the popular vote by a significant amount. He's a democratic reformer from New York City. And um, the, the question goes, the question of who won is contested because of four states, three of which are in the deep south. And what happens is the Republican Congress sends a commission down to the south to decide which which slate of electors to accept. Uh, James Garfield is on that, just trivia here. That's how he be starts become, becoming his climb to becoming being President Garfield, which didn't turn out well. But, um, but in that case, when the essentially there's a deal cut, um, there isn't really violence. There isn't really somebody having to stand up to a bully because the North essentially backs down and says, yeah, you can, to the Southern Democrats, yeah, you can have control of the South. Now, just a trivia point here. They did not take the, the if, if nobody else takes anything ever away from me, I will sleep happy if people recognize that the North did not take the troops out of the South in 1876 or 1877. They did not, they did not, they did not. <laughs> All that happened was the troops that were stationed around the South Carolina State House um, uh, went back to their um, to their uh, barracks. Which, if anybody knows Columbia, South Carolina, you can look it up on Google Maps. There's the State House and the waiting pool, or the reflecting pool of the University of South Carolina Library is where the troops, where the barracks were. So they walk down the hill to those barracks. It's like a two minute walk. That's all that happened. The troops get moved later because of the Great Railroad Strike and because of the Indian Wars, but the, the US troops never leave the South. We staged the South and the, the Spanish-American War out of the South. And then of course, World War I. So anyway, there's that. But, but it, to go back to what we were talking about, um, in that case, there, there was this moment, but the, the Northerners who were trying to upset the apple cart, if you will, sort of said, yeah, okay, you can have the South back. It's gonna become a one party white supremacist state until at least the 1960s, but we're gonna go forward with that old system intact, you think? I don't know. I mean, I do think, I, I think balance of power and the idea that an equilibrium is being thrown off. So by balance of power, I actually don't mean something lofty in general, but I actually do mean along the lines that we're talking about here, brass tax power. Um, I think people violate principles in those moments. I think people invent things they never would have thought inventing of inventing in those moments. I think they go to extremes in those moments. I think those are moments of invention. And I think um, for better and worse, those, those are moments of political invention. Well, so, so now that's the next thing. What happens after that, of course, is that the Republicans recognize that they can't win in the South anymore. So they let in six new states in 1889 and 1890, once they know they'll never have the South again. And that's how we get North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, and Washington. And that's the moment is again, that I, that I identify in the new book, when the West with its hierarchical ideology that it inherited from the South becomes a political entity because all the weight of the Electoral College is now in the West in, in after 1890. So in terms of it being a moment of innovation, absolutely, they're, they're kind of working around the other way. They didn't expect it to turn out the way they did, that it did, but they thought that that was going to put them back on the map as an electoral body. Right, 
Right, to restore balance. To restore balance, yeah. 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 Unfortunately, the West worked with the South instead of with, uh, with the East, but they didn't expect that. <laughs> Contingency. Exactly. Um, let, me, um, let me ask you, um, in a sense, let me take you a little bit more into the present. Um, let's have a historian to historian conversation here. So, you know, as historians, as we started out by saying, um, we go through time, we find moments that sort of echo with the present or shed light on the present or rhyme with the present. In one way or another, you can look through American history. You can see other moments that have been highly polarized. You could see other moments in which there either have been threats of violence or some kind of violence. So here we are as historians in this current moment. So what do you think? I mean, we can talk about this back and forth. What do we think about democracy and our faith in it and, and people's faith in it and sort of where are we as a, as a democracy right now? So, you know, that's a really, I'm actually really glad you asked that because, um, you know, people ask why I'm still hopeful about America. And it's because I do believe in democracy. I believe in human self-determination. I believe in the, um, in the, the drive for human beings to have control over their own destinies. But one of the things that, one of the reasons to me that we're in this crazy, crazy moment is because, you know, one of the things that I was trying to explore in the book was, an was, was how politicians use language to polarize us in such a way that it enables them to take power. And, um, and the, this moment, it seems to me, is a moment in which uh, we're really at a place that looks a, a huge amount like the 1850s because it's a moment in which oligarchs have managed to do that and have managed really to, to get rid of, of, of the principles of democracy. You know, wealth is really, uh, um, has really moved upward. Your chances of moving, of, of being, having a better life than your parents did are much smaller than they used to be. Um, they, um, uh, um, the, 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 the idea that, I, I'm sorry, I just saw the Jeff Cabas service is here. Hey, Jeff. Oh. <laughs> You knocked me off there. Um, <laughs> and I guess you can't say hi back, but hi. Um, uh, um, but, but I have faith in it. But I'm also very worried because we're at a moment where, um, where politicians, I think, have deliberately um, divided us. Uh, to the point that a lot of people don't recognize that we still have a lot more in common than we used to. And, I, I'm, and I'm not worried the reason I think we started with Jefferson and with Andrew Johnson after the Civil War is that I don't think we're looking necessarily at an Andrew Johnson moment in this, you know, going forward. The question is, are we looking at a Jeffersonian moment? And that, um, that seems to me to be really an open question. What do you think? I think it is an open question. I think, um, I think there are ways in which, uh, oddly enough, and it's sort of counterintuitive, technology makes it harder to know what other Americans are thinking of each other because they, really? the social media today, the telegraph in the 19th century, highlight certain voices and hide other voices and, and skew. <laughs> Have and, you been on Twitter? <laughs> I know, <laughs> you think? Um, but, but it makes it, you know, impossible. It suggests to you that there is absolutely no way that Americans have any hope or faith in each other. And I don't think that's true in the way that it appears to be on Twitter. Um, I think that's, you know, a venue that does certain things. And I think technology complicates democracy in all kinds of interesting ways because it, it changes the conversation of democracy. But like you, I guess, I, I sort of feel like we're at a moment where a lot of basic institutions of government and, and politics even have been challenged or shredded or denounced or we've lost faith in a lot of things that I think probably many of us never thought we would lose faith in in this dramatic a way. Um, but kind of as you were just saying and I as I started out by saying um, the we, the national we that we are, those institutions are part of it, but really it's it's our sense of our commitment to a democratic process that matters. Now I do think that we're in a moment when 
a lot of people, this isn't just America, but in the world have kind of lost track of what democracy is and what democracy offers and why you need to hang on to it and what you lose when you lose it. So I think it's an important moment for people like you and me and others to speak out about it because I think, which is why we started with democracy tonight, because um, I think it's one of those words like ism words, you know, capitalism, socialism, that we don't think about the real meaning. And we actually really, really need to think about what democracy is and what it requires right now. So that's a really interesting way to put it, you know, that people have forgotten what democracy really is and what it means. And that, I think, is kind of the story that I was trying to tell, that people get so caught up, for example, after the Civil War and the question of who's paying the taxes, something that echoed brilliantly after, um, after uh, the New Deal and after the taxes that went along with that and with World War II and with the rise after that in the 1950s of like Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, which said that the federal government was going to commit resources to pr promoting desegregation. Um, and people got so caught up in my tax dollars or not letting my neighbor have that or what the schools are going to look like that they were really they were really willing to jettison a lot of what what democracy is all about and you know i see this all the time on social media people saying well i hate you know you know the democrats because they're not doing this you know there's no difference between biden or trump there's no you know all this and and somebody saying to me that they're that there was no way that they were going to vote for um, for any of the current candidates because none of them were were accomplished what you know what that particular uh, that particular person wanted, and and none of them were going to be good for the the group that that person identified with. And I my answer was, if you think things are bad now under the under where we're going, you go ahead and try fascism. You know, see how you feel about that because if you think things are really bad right now this is the best you're going to get, right? You know, if, if you're going to trade it in for fascism, you got yourself a real problem here or oligarchy or any of the many different ways that we could live. And that seems to me something that maybe we have lost track of in our real willingness to divide ourselves along the lines that say some people are better than others. I, I think that's true. And I think, I think that's another ism that people don't fully understand what it is. I think somehow people have lost track of the fact that, um, Democracy relies on good faith contests in which the people weigh in and someone is given power based on a good faith contest that does not have a predetermined outcome, right? That's, that's the, the sort of mechanics of democracy. And I don't, think, I don't think people are thinking about what it means to not have that kind of good faith election and to have things be predetermined. And I think it's very easy to think about um, feeling comfortable with that if you assume the people you like are going to stay in power. But again, I don't, I don't think people understand the ways in which like contingency and the fact that things aren't predetermined and that we really determine outcomes. That's the real guts of, of democracy. Well, and that's what the 1800 election had. It had a faith in the idea that the other side could win and, and Jefferson really wasn't going to kill God. You know that that everybody had a although you know that everybody, everybody had a uh, that, that you could have a legitimate election and the other side could win and one of the things that I was trying to highlight in uh, how the South won is the idea that when you lose that sense of legitimacy when a small group of people takes over the system first first um, in terms of social media and in terms of you know I talk about literature a lot and in terms of the way society thinks and then they increasingly move the government so that it, it benefits them and then they start cutting people away from the vote and then they start to delegitimize their opponents saying they're un-American, they shouldn't vote, their ideas are illegitimate. Then you know you might like that if they're your people, but at the end of the day, what you've done is you've gotten rid of democracy and replaced it with an if you're lucky, simply an oligarchy. And when that happens, they don't care what you think. And that's you know that mechanical destruction, I'm not sure it has been emphasized enough in where we are right now. You know, you, people are like, I want my team to win. It's like, if your team is the only one left standing, you lost the game. You might have won, your team might have won, but you've lost the game. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, and I think, you know, um, I, I guess this goes back to some of what you've written about in your book and I write about it in my book too, which is words 
um, and that it's easy to get lost in rhetoric um, and to get caught up in the emotion of it and the implications of it and not think about the reality. You know, that, that's some of what I talk about in my book is people standing up in Congress in the last year or two before the Civil War and saying over and over again, watch your words, people here on the floor, watch your words, because if you use the wrong words, you're going to set off a, a sort of flash of emotion that's going to drive us into a place that we can't come back from. And, I, and so I think that's worth remembering too, particularly at this moment when we're in a moment when rushes of rhetoric and extreme rhetoric are bouncing all the time around us. And again, that helps us lose track of what we lose if we lose democracy, of the, despite the fact that the vulnerability of democracy is that you can have all of this turmoil, it ends up relying on people to give power. And I just don't know if people realize what it means when we lose that, that power. Well, and one of the things that's really interesting is, um, obviously we picked on 1800, but during the Civil War, you know, when Abraham Lincoln talks about creating a country that, that acknowledges equality before the law and equality of access to resources uh, and to education, he cared a lot about education. And you see that again, um, to some degree with Teddy Roosevelt at the, in the early progressive era, although I make the case that Teddy Roosevelt's uh, progressivism was possible because of his racism and his sexism, the idea that, you know, he was saying, once again, everybody can be equal so long as you all are like me, although that's not quite what he was saying. It's not quite as bad as the original guys were. But then the, the guy who always jumps out at me is Eisenhower. And, um, and FDR, of course, FDR and Eisenhower, who are taking a moment after the 1920s, which were really isolationist. They were really the idea that a very few people should run the country. And we get the new 1924 uh, immigration law, which li really limits immigration. And we get the rise, the second rise of the KKK, and, um, you know, which is a huge deal and anti-immigrant uh, sentiment. And, and they come out at, at a time, you know, people always say to me, you know, everything's lost, everything's going to hell in a handbasket, you know? And I always say, the world turns on a dime because if you had told someone in 1920, 19, I'm sorry, 1928, that by 1932, FDR would win in the landslide, they would have thought you were on drugs and particularly good ones, you know, and the, um, you know, and the, what, what really makes a difference. So you remember FDR coming out and saying, you know, I, you know, the, 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 uh, he doesn't call them oligarchs, but the, whoever they are, the, the, the rich guys hate me and I welcome their hatred. We're in, all, we're in this together. And then Eisenhower doing the same saying, you know, the communist leaders and the fascist leaders, but by then he's more concerned about communism are using our racial hierarchy in this country to argue that democracy is a sham. And so we can't be like this. And you've got people like Frank Sinatra um, recording uh, those short movies in, you know, talking about how in America, everybody is equal, no religion, no race. And you've got Superman doing his, um, his that very famous poster of Superman in the 1950s, talking to high school kids going, you know, remember kids, if anybody says that, you know, you have to be part of a certain religion or a certain race, they are un-American. <laughs> and that really, you know, by the, by my, one of my favorite pieces of trivia from, uh, from the new book is the fact that that old, that, that new idea took on to the point that the old reactionary idea of a hierarchical society takes refuge in Foghorn Leghorn. The, the, yeah, the cartoon <laughs> character, because he was a, a knockoff of a guy called Senator Claghorn, who was on a popular radio show, and he was supposed to be sort of such an unre unrepentant Southern Confederate that he wouldn't go through the Lincoln Tunnel, for example. And, <laughs> you know, he goes, I say, I say son, um, but, you know, like, it was about language, you know, the language is what solidified the power of the oligarchs in the first place, right. but it was also the language that took democracy back away from them. Well, let's, and, and see, we're getting near a point where we need to um, open things up for questions, but before we do that, let's go right to what you just said, which is language being a way that people can bring democracy back. So we're talking about threats to democracy, we're talking about words being used to denounce and destroy democracy, and institutions of government being attacked and Americans losing faith in each other. But I think you and I both end up in an optimistic place about the fact that things are in the process of happening right now and that the democratic process leaves room for us as Americans 
to step forward and have something to say and do something and that we're not in a place where um, we have to simply throw up our hands and say, oh, well, I guess we've lost faith in democracy. I, I assume that you're in the same kind That's of- a cheerful, It's a cheerful thought. No, I do agree. Obviously, I do agree. You and I wouldn't spend as much time doing these talks as we do if we didn't feel right. that one. Right. Um, I, and, and we do need to get to questions, but I have to laugh. Somebody has asked if, you know, if, if it is correct that the South, that the troops did not leave the South in 76, when did, you know, was, was that the end of Reconstruction? And I, and I am resisting jumping up and screaming, no, because, um, because that's actually a really good question. Like, when did, did Reconstruction end? And this was actually put to me by a friend of mine once when I was arguing that, you know, we still had issues, you know, that the, the troops moving were not that important. We were actually in Columbia, South Carolina discussing this. And he goes, well, so when did it end? And I said, well, you could argue this. He goes, no, no. When did it end? If there's an end, there must be a minute, like a second that it ended. And I thought, darn it. So I actually <laughs> went back into the newspapers and into the congressional record. And if you really want to know what they thought at the time, the answer was at the time, now we don't have to think about it this way and historians don't, but at the time, reconstruction was literally the reconstruction of the American government. So it ended the minute that the Georgia representatives and senators were, were, were sworn back into Congress after the passage of the 15th Amendment. So it ended, mm -hmm. in, like I want to say, like it's 71 or so, 1871 or so. I can't remember when it was. It might have been 70. There is a minute when that happens. But of course, that had significance to them, that reconstruction of the government. It has a heck of a lot less to us. Right. But I, but I don't like 77 because the, that everybody points to because we get that number only because there is a book written in 1890, uh, 1890 called Why the Solid South by a bunch of, um, of segregationist white supremacists who worked in Congress led by a guy named Hillary Herbert. And, um, and they pick that date because that's the date that white Southerners take control of all the Southern states. And I don't want to do it their way. I, I think we get to define things our own way. And I don't want to take the word of, Southern, of white supremacists to do that. So that's my diatribe on the troops and Reconstruction. And there, if you care, is the minute that they thought Reconstruction But here's in. the thing about that that's fascinating is in, in my last book, I talk about the moment when the Southerners stood up individually and said on the floor of Congress, we are now leaving the Union and left Congress. And you saw people in the galleries looking down and watching and people on the floor literally saying, the Union just dissolved, like in front of us. And so the symbolism of, of them seeing that symbolic moment and taking it that way. Interesting. And what you just described is such a wonderful kind of closure moment. To that. That's really interesting. But you know, I have a question for you about that, and other people should be allowed to ask this, of course. But like, why were they allowed to do that? They had taken the oath to the union. I'm dead serious. I've asked, I can't tell you how many people I've asked this. And the same with like Robert E. Lee. Why not clap him in irons? You know, he took an oath to the union, and you're not usually allowed to go like, oh, oopsie poopsie, never mind. You know? <laughs> Why did you say oopsie poopsie? Um, I mean, some of it, I, I, I'm not going to have the answer to that question, but at the time, um, the language that they're using and the logic that they're using has to do with getting instructions from their state. My state has told me ah. that I am to do this now. And now I must stand up and leave because my state has sent me instructions. But don't they take an oath to the, to the government? I, I can't tell you why that became okay, but, but that was the language that they used was that my people have told me, my governor has told me, my legislature has told me, this is what's going to happen. Well, the senators maybe come from the legislature. I've just always wondered, if anybody knows, yeah. throw in the chat, because I've always wondered, especially how the military people could just be like, we're done, yeah. you know? No, I, it's a good question. Okay, so we're gonna turn things over to questions. I know there is someone. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the wrong form over here. Hi. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Heather. I think everybody just wants to hear you uh, just keep talking. <laughs> um, all 1,000 people watching right now. Um, 
And there are a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get to all of them. If you guys want to take a, a look at the q and I'll try to pick out some good questions in the meantime. Um, one is, here's a question from Katie. Uh, would you flesh out why you think we are more in a Jeffersonian moment than, uh, rather than a Johnsonian moment? Um, I mean, I guess part of that has to do with the fact that there were options with the Jeffersonian moment. So there was a moment, it was a hard, it was a breaking moment. Um, people were afraid that the system would fall apart and it didn't. And there was a chance for people to come together and they kind of had faith in the process. I mean, at the moment, we're not, things have not been determined yet. I don't know. Heather, if you had another meaning when you connected Jeffersonian moments to now as opposed to Reconstruction moments to now. Yeah, yeah, what I was saying, and I can tie this into some of the questions that are on the other list as well. What all I was saying was that, um, that, that if Jefferson for all, and now I'm going to have to defend him, which is just miserable. <laughs> um, if Jefferson had wanted to create, uh, to create a crisis, he absolutely could have. And, you know, to some degree, you know, he, he does pull some nasty stuff. He throws some people off the votes and voting rules in New Jersey. And of course, he's the reason we have a messed up electoral college because he does the, the electoral college had been by district in the past and he makes it winner take all, which is not great. Anyway, there I've gotten my digs in at Jefferson again, but um, he could have said, he could have said, the people that I am replacing were illegitimate. We should kill them. Um, or we should d disfranchise them. We could do whatever we wanted to. And he didn't. He said, it is legitimate to have opposition, to have loyal opposition. And we should come together as Americans. And he says he is this inaugural address. And I made fun of it because he said, we should all be Americans now behind me. But, um, but he, he didn't say, I'm just going to be the president for my people. He said, we are all Americans. Um, Andrew Johnson did not do that. In 1864 or 5, Andrew Johnson quite literally said, I want nothing to do with the Republican Party. He was a former Democrat. And he said that they were, um, were creating an empire and that they were forcing what he called um, Negro equality on the country and that they needed to be voted out of office. And he not only said they were illegitimate, he literally called for the execution of some of the Republican Congress people, congressmen at that point. And that's a moment where you know, we were grappling today with the present. And a lot of you have referenced um, uh, Joe Biden's speech at Gettysburg today. It was not an accident that Joe Biden went to Gettysburg and gave a, a, a speech about coming together and about, yeah, exactly. And that's a little bit what we had in mind when we focused uh, this particular talk on how you come together at different moments and how you reclaim democracy after it's been overtaken by oligarchy. Because I was really grappling with why, you know, I just wrote a book about why everything falls apart after the Civil War, why we don't get that moment of equality, why that just simply gets overridden despite the fact there have been almost 600,000 people thrown into the maw of trying to destroy that oligarchy. And what I really came down to was Andrew Johnson. You know, Andrew Johnson said, yeah, I'm not giving this fight up. And he gave people the blueprint for continuing that fight for the next 150 years. And so I wonder if, um, you know, what I was really aiming for there was that, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the next month. But it certainly feels to me, and certainly we have been extraordinarily divided, but it certainly feels to me as I watch social media like a hawk as I do, and as I watch the way people are talking, and as I watch like things like the fact Facebook today announced that it is um, no longer going to permit there to be any of QAnon on it in any way. They could have done that anytime they wanted to in the last two years and they didn't. They are, their finger is in the wind and they're saying Americans don't like this. Americans are turning against this. And that's the exact opposite of what they did in 1850. And it's the exact opposite of what happened in the 18, after the war in the, in the 1860s. So what all I was trying to suggest was that if in fact we are lucky enough not to have an Andrew Johnson moment in, in, you know, after this upcoming election and instead to get a Jeffersonian moment, 
Um, and I don't necessarily mean that anybody's going to look like Jefferson or Andrew J Johnson necessarily. Um, I think I, I do think I can see the country coming back together in a way that a lot of people don't really think is possible right now. So that's all I was trying to get at with that. And, um, and, I, and I will say, I'll, I'll just add to that, I think that's entirely possible. Um, and I think, um, well, you and I were talking before when we were chatting about what we wanted to chat about tonight. Um, and we were talking about the fact that um, people are very tempted to look for some kind of hero who's going to fix things and save the day and swoop in. And we've had any number of them in recent years of crisis that we thought this person will fix it. And of course, they didn't. Um, <laughs> but, you know, what, what we were saying is, you know, the, the people who can fix it is us. We're looking at them. That's that right. it is, it is, that's it. It is all of you people, all of you 944 people who are beaming in from out there and everybody else on Facebook and us are the people who can make some kind of a difference. And I will say, I know we're almost out of time, but not quite, but this gives me the perfect opportunity to say, vote, vote, yeah. vote, whatever you do vote, because that's the, the core moment of power that you have as an American is vote. And in this particular election, boy, do your votes matter to an extreme degree. Vote and, as I say, take up oxygen so that you, you talk about de democratic values. And, and I don't mean capital D, I mean what America stands for. Because at the end of the day, you know, this is one of those elections that is really about um, whether we're going to preserve democracy or whether we are going to go full-throated into um, something that looks quite different than that. And, um, and you know, Joanne and I are both big believers in, uh, in democracy. Definitely. Um, I think we're down to, to, to a minute or two before. So I think, Nadine, we're sort of at a closing moment. Yes, we are. Uh, even though, I mean, I think people just want, everybody just wants you to, to get going, <laughs> start writing a book together. Um, we can do a 24-hour marathon. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, it is, it is a little bit frustrating because, of course, had we time, there are terrific questions here. Um, you know, did the Southern planters pattern themselves after aristocrats in England? Sure, they didn't inherit that. They literally reinvented themselves. They literally took on names that they thought sounded like they belonged in, in Sir Walter Scott's novels. So they changed their names from like, you know, and I'm making this up, but like John Smith to Rhett Butler, you know. Um, but what's interesting about that is, particularly in the early period when people were like modeling themselves after who they thought the great men were in the old world, the American version of them was so small and simple in comparison with everything that came before. There's a long string of um, letters from people who, you know, particularly Southerners sort of create themselves as these grand men and then go to England and see you know, what it really is like. And they realize that they're in a little tiny facsimile of what came before. Yeah, what are they, what are they, because they're just so much smaller scale or what? Smaller scale, more modest looking, um, you know, there, there's just, there's a, um, I'm not gonna remember the name of it. There's a book that has photographs in it that I've seen a long time ago. Um, might even be by Bernard Bale in a short, collection of essays and he shows what a grand manor house looked like in England and at the same time what it looked like in Virginia and oh, yeah. it's oh, a, yeah. a world you know just a world of difference and Americans don't know that because most of them don't get a chance to see anything else and do you know you, and, and if anybody is interested you can see on the Clemson um, on the Clemson campus is the plantation home of um, what's his name uh, you know uh, uh, John C. Calhoun. And, um, and you hear plantation home and you think plantation home, at least I did. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a nice house. It's a nice house that I live in, but like they had like 11 people crammed into this house. It looks not unlike what uh, a pretty middling New England farmer would have had at the same time. And I, literally I went into it and the brickwork's beautiful and the, and the pathway, but I went into it and I'm like, and, and we, where's the plantation? And they're like, uh, you mean it was all around here? I'm like, no, no, the plantation home. And they're like, this, this is it. <laughs> and I'm like, really? You know? <laughs> no, so I, I want to be overawed. I want to point something out that someone said because it's really worth mentioning. 
Um, James says, um, one of the few bright spots of our current situation is the massive increase in civic engagement. And I want to touch on that because that's so true and that's so important. And I think um, it's very easy and in many ways we have taken for granted the democratic process. And as much as we're all in a state of constant anxiety right now over whatever it is that we're anxious about, that's a positive thing is that we have been reminded in a really direct, powerful way that you can't take things for granted, that civic engagement matters, that you need to see what's going on and watch what's going on and be willing to step forward and say something. And I, you know, it's nice to have something right now to feel encouraged about. And that's one of the big things that in the last few years I've really felt encouraged by. Yes. As I'm fond of saying, democracy is not a spectator sport and Correct. people have stepped up to the plate and are, they're really, are really taking it in their own hands. And that's a, it's a just, it's a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing to see. So thank you all for being here. It's been, a, it's been a great deal of fun. It has and, been wonderful to be here. I love having a chance to work with Heather. Uh, I love having a chance to talk with you folks about history and democracy past and present. I love having an opportunity to say to a lot of people who are watching, vote, <laughs> vote. I will say that as many times as I can before the election. And, and it's nice to welcome you into our world. Um, this, is, this is actually what we do in our spare time. So, so thanks for coming along and, um, and we'll see you next time. And thank you from the National Arts Club to you guys as well. Um, if the audience, if you're not following Joanne and Heather already, please do. They're easy to find. Um, and thank you. And from the National Arts Club as, as well, please vote. And have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good night. Bye, everybody. Good night.